you just joining us, here's what you need to know right now about the crisis in Egypt. The United States and other nations today condemn the increasing attacks on journalists and diplomats in Egypt. Live pictures from Cairo impossible tonight because of that crackdown. On Capitol Hill tonight, the Senate is expected to pass a resolution sponsored by Senators John McCain and John Kerry calling on President Mubarak to immediately begin an orderly transition to a democratic political system. I spoke to Senator McCain earlier today asking him about the Mubarak regime saying there would be chaos if he left now. Well, I think that uh, either rightly or wrongly, President Mubarak has become a symbol of the uh, repressive uh, government that has not allowed the people of Egypt to express their democratic uh, yearnings and uh, give them the rights that they, as human beings, deserve. And so uh, if we could get a transition government in place that's representative not only of the army, but also other democratic elements within Egyptian society. And I think there is a good opportunity to have this violence subside. But the longer that this transition is delayed, I think the likelihood of further escalation and violence is increased. Should the United States be saying, we will cut off aid if you don't do this now? Should the United States be saying, we will suspend the planned arms sale if you don't do this now? I think we should. Uh, I think we should wait on all of that. There's always time for that. I think uh, that one of our strongest uh, influences here is the Egyptian military. We have very close military-to-military -military relationship with the Egyptians. They've been to our war colleges, our command and staff colleges, and uh, they understand. I think the situation rather well. I'd. I'd rather not um, uh, issue threats uh, at this time until we have exhausted all other methods of persuasion. I'm not, I'm not sure that that wouldn't backfire, to tell you the truth, John. Uh, President Mubarak's team is saying the United States is meddling here, stepping in where it shouldn't. They're saying that publicly. We also know some of the other governments in the region who are watching this quite nervously are a bit nervous themselves, that perhaps the United States, at least publicly, is playing too much of a role here. How's the president handling this so far, in your view? I have to say the president, I think, is handling this situation uh, well under the most difficult kind of circumstances. We are paying a price for historic neglect uh, of the human rights, which we have traditionally stood for throughout our history, our advocacy of it in the name of realpolitik. And I think over time that doesn't work. And I am keenly aware of the dangers of radical Islamic influence in every one of these countries. It is a huge danger. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, in my view, is a great threat to democracy. Anybody who advocates Sharia law certainly isn't our kind of Democrat. And so this, this is a, probably the most dangerous time that in recent memory in the Middle East, due to the implications throughout the region, not to mention the implications to where, as far as Israel is concerned. But as you know, there are some who have a different view. I want you to listen here to the former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who says, A, the United States is losing the war on terror, and B, that he thinks the president could make it worse right here. We're losing the war because there are madrasas around the planet teaching hatred. We're losing the war because the network of terrorists is bigger, not smaller. There's a real possibility that in a few weeks, if we're unfortunate, Egypt will join Iran and join Lebanon and join Gaza, and join the things that are happening that are extraordinarily dangerous to us. Do you see it as negatively as that? A, are we losing? And B, do you see Egypt as part of a growing Islamic caliphate in the Middle East? That the former speaker uh, drew a scenario which is entirely possible. Our job is to act that it doesn't unfold that way. And uh, I don't see how it hurts us to stand up for the things that are the very principles of our existence, and we believe it applies to everyone in the world, not just those of us in the United States. I'm not a starry-eyed idealist. I know the nature of war, and I think I understand these issues, and I understand the criticality. But for us to be on the side of governments that are oppressive and repressive in the long run can never benefit 
us and help us achieve our goals. I, I know you think we overdwell on this, but you ran against President Obama yep. in 2008. You had finally a sit down with him at the White House. Just can you share a little bit of personal reflection on what that moment was like and the evolution of a relationship that I think it is quite fair to say turned frosty after the election, especially in the early days of the administration, and perhaps seems to be warming at least a bit now? Well, it's not a an issue of warmth or lack of warmth. I strongly disagreed with the health care reform, with the stimulus package, the spending, and those were, I felt passionately about. But I don't think it ever interfered with my personal relationship with President Obama, which uh, frankly developed here while he was in the United States Senate. Um, now I think that, uh, and I say this with respect, the president has shifted in a, number of, in a number of ways as a result of the November election, which I think is appropriate. And we have a common interest, common values, and I hope and I believe there are areas where we could work together for the good of the country. And so was this a perfunctory professional president meets leading Republican senator meeting, or was it more of a personal, let's have a new chapter and let's try to have a a very productive personal dialogue as well as professional dialogue. The President of the United States doesn't have a lot of time for socializing and I think it was along the line of going through uh, some issues that there are every prospect that we could r work together on under the right circumstances and I look forward to that opportunity. We're going to go back through some of the Iraq war debate with the release of Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, book and you and Secretary Rumsfeld, you might have a better relationship with President Obama than you do with Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, he talks in the book, uh, known and unknown it's called, that you have a quote, hair trigger temper and what Secretary Rumsfeld says, a propensity to shift his positions to appeal to the media. Uh, my, my only response is that I, I was over in Iraq enough to, knew that, to know that we were losing and American lives were being lost. There's nothing more important than that. And I came back and we had literally pitched battles on the issue of a surge. And he steadfastly opposed it. He did not support such a thing. He didn't believe we need additional troops. That was a huge bone of contention between myself and Secretary Rumsfeld. And fortunately, after the election of 2006, the president decided to replace him. We had the surge, and we've achieved a significant degree of success in Iraq, which we wouldn't have under Secretary Rumsfeld. I respect Secretary Rumsfeld and his service to the country. It was nothing personal. But you make the position today that history proved John McCain right. I think so. I think it should prove David Petraeus right. Senator John McCain, appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you.